Okay, great. Uh, thank you, GA, for um, for joining us for this free Friday session. First thing I want to say is um, is um, let's uh, let's say a happy uh, Juneteenth in the sense that this is a uh, a day that that we're here to uh, to learn. Dr. Shockley is going to talk to us a little bit about that. For those of the um, 1,370 some individuals that are part of the audience, and then and keep learning, uh, keep climbing. We thank you all for joining us. I'm going to do a quick introduction of uh, Kimmet Shockley, Dr. Kimmet Shockley, but I want to let you all know who I am. My name is James Page. I serve as the um, Vice President and uh, Chief Diversity Officer for General Assembly. I've been with General Assembly now for about um, three months now. Uh, we've really t leaned in hard into our responsibility to be an organization that brings not only um, uh, strategy on how we improve diversity and inclusion, but we also bring um, uh, knowledge and, and truth. And uh, for those of you who have not sat in sessions with me today, that's what we're going to be talking about is, uh, is truth and some, uh, some knowledge. I also want to set the stage that, um, that I'm not a huge fan of saying we're going to create safe spaces because sometimes we're going to hear things that are going to shake us a little bit. What I will say is that we're going to create courageous spaces and bold spaces. These are spaces where we are best to learn and we're opening our minds up. So real quick about Dr. Kimmet Shockley. Dr. Shockley is a professor at the Howard University in Washington, DC. He is in the School of Education, co-author of, um, co-executive director of the Kai Institute, which is an organization that does consulting and it creates uh, documentary films and creates educational content. Dr. Shockley is the author of numerous books and publications. Um, his most recent book is called Campus Uprisings, uh, which very much parallels kind of the situation we're going through today. Dr. Shockley, um, as present research is, um, includes funding of the Moran in villages. The Moran groups are a group of Africans who escape enslavement and won victories over their captors. From that study, he co-authored and co-published a film which is called For Humanity, Culture, Community, and Moranich. You have Arunich. to get Arunich. Thank you very much, Dr. Shockley. <laughs> yeah. um, which has been featured in, um, in multiple national and international film festivals. In addition to the scholarly and consulting pursuits, Dr. Shockley mentors many, many urban youths. He also is a, uh, was a college football player, a high school football player. He, is a, uh, he was a college student leader. He is a community advocate. Um, he also um, has a um, uh, pursuits in, um, in helping personal, um, helping youth. Uh, from a personal note, uh, Dr. Shockley uh, and I have known each other, um, I guess we're probably pushing 40 years or over 40, 40 years. <laughs> yeah. In addition to that, uh, you may look at someone like Dr. Shockley and, and we're talking about biases for a second. If you don't mind me saying this, Dr. Shockley, you look at him and you see a, a, a deep, dark chocolate black man who stands about six foot five. And unless you're slimming it up, pushing the, uh, the scale at about 300 some, but it's probably- I'll take that. He'll take that. But it's probably <laughs> the most accomplished pianist that you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I'm going to say, turn this over to my good friend, my brother, and uh, say, uh, remember Dr. Shockley, they're not ready for 100% of you. We're doing aiming at 55 to 75% of you. Oh, 75, okay, I'll taper that down to 75. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm at 75 now. And so I've put together something that I think will be useful for all of us. Uh, thank you so much to you, James, for that introduction. And thank you so much for joining in today for this conversation that's going to be focused on uh, Juneteenth, but really kind of focused on Black history and culture, which I think is the big theme here. What is it that's happening in our society today? Why is there a focus on Juneteenth this year? Why are there so many protests? But more importantly, who are these people? Because I think that many of us attended institutions for college, for high school, and as a former teacher and as a professor, having taught at three different universities, I can attest that very little information is really out there about who we are. So I'm gonna also do a little uh, information on our theme today. 
I know that many of you are probably wondering, what do you mean when you say the illusion of Juneteenth? So I'm going to start. Uh, first, let me just say thank you to the General Assembly and to James Page uh, for the invitation. I, I hope that everybody will really gain a lot from this presentation today. And I think that if you do, if you can, if you, if in paying attention to the, uh, to the presentation today, you gain quite a bit, you'll be light years ahead of many people as it pertains to the knowledge uh, that should come along with a notion that Black Lives Matter. As James said, I am a six foot four, 300 plus pound former uh, college offensive lineman. Uh, and I also, when I was in college, was a, uh, a um, uh, offensive tackle and I also was a piano major. So my major in college at first, I switched, was piano performance. And for Dr. those of you who are, yes. Uh for some reason, you're getting a little bit of crackle in your um, audio that um, that I'm getting messages about. I'm not too sure why that's happening, but you may want to try to move back or forth or something. Or, I don't know. Do you still hear it now? We do not. I think that's uh, better. Hopefully, that hopefully it fixes because everything here seems to be okay. But uh, I was a piano major. Now, I raised that because. I wonder sometimes when we look at people, do we think we can figure things out about them quickly? Is it clear that when you look at me that I can play Rachmaninoff and play Beethoven? It might be more clear if you saw me in person that, I'm, and, uh, that I played offensive line. Would it be clear to you that uh, I have four college degrees? Would you, would, do you think the police would guess that if they saw me? Um, would it be clear that I like watching the Golden Girls on television? You know, so in other words, we can't just guess about people. We have to get to know who people are. And one of my concerns about Juneteenth is that we're ready for the celebration, but do we know who the people are? So, what, so I'm going to talk a bit about what Juneteenth is up front and at the end, but I'm going to introduce you to who the people are. Who are the people? So as we get started, I want to talk about a couple things, the importance of lens first. And I hope you can see my screen. If, if, if they cannot see my screen, please let me know, because I, am, I have started with the PowerPoint. We can't see your screen. Thank you. Great. Lens refers to the set of beliefs, understandings, and life experiences that give a person and or a group their particular and unique perspective about the world. As you listen today, I want you to ask yourself the following questions. What is the lens of the presenter? Ask yourself, what is your own personal lens? And since all things come from a lens, based on our definition up above, what is the truth about everything? How can you have a lens? I have a lens, but then there's truth. So that's required information because what we're going to need to do in order for us to get anywhere today is to properly place the subject. So in a sentence, of course, you have a subject and you can have an object in a sentence. Unfortunately, what oftentimes happens with Black history, when we're talking about Black history and culture, the topic will be Black history or culture, but the subject, the proper placement of the subject will be something else. In other words, what we want to do today for our conversation is to think about, well, what would it mean for an African-American person to talk about what is happening in society today from a perspective that comes from the Black experience, okay? That's very different than having a conversation from a perspective that comes from any other experience, okay? So we can talk about things. I could talk about uh, I could talk about the Chinese, Chinese history and culture from my perspective would be different than the Chinese talking about Chinese history and culture. So you'll have to ask yourself, what is the lens of the presenter? I'm coming from a Black-centered lens, focused and centered on the Black experience. 
ask yourself, what is your lens? And since all things come from a lens, what is the truth about everything? Okay, let's look at a popular definition of Juneteenth. Everything that you see in front of you was taken from Wikipedia. Uh, and so these are things that are on Wikipedia right there on the internet, except I think maybe the last sentence. I'm gonna read a couple of the slides today, but we won't be reading many slides today, probably just two or three. The popular definition of Juneteenth is that it is an unofficial American holiday, also called Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Cell Liberation Day, celebrated annually on the 19th of June in the United States to commemorate Union Army General Gordon Granger's reading of federal orders in the city of Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, proclaiming that all enslaved persons in the United States state of Texas were now free. Watermelon and red soda water are the oldest traditional foods on Juneteenth, commemorating the blood that Black people spilled during enslavement. Some authors note that there has always been soul food served, fried chicken, barbecue, greens, and Black-eyed peas. Some groups read the Emancipation Proclamation aloud at the celebration. That last sentence is true, but it wasn't on Wikipedia. Now let's contextualize so that we can begin to really understand the relationship between Black people, their history, their culture, and this special day called Juneteenth. And then we're going to look at a definition again later. I'll start at the very beginning. The Old Dubai Gorge region in Tanzania, which is in Africa. And the reason I'm starting there is because Again, that's the beginning. Humanity is said to have started in this place. And these bones were found there. When the archaeologists, Lewis and Mary Lakey, who you can read about for further information, found those bones, the idea that they had was to first get the bones tested. They wanted to see, well, what archaeologically do we see when we test these bones and when we try to figure out where, who, what was this? What kind of person was this? And they found that it was the, the first homo sapien named her Lucy. She was renamed uh, by Africans on the continent uh, to Dinkanesh. In fact, they call her Mama Dinkanesh. The oldest bones found in the world. And they say that these bones are 2.5 to 2.7 million years old. In that sense, African life and history go back millions and millions of years. So I want us to think in the context of, well, first of all, well, why does that matter in the context of Juneteenth? Well, in order for us to contextualize Juneteenth, we have to understand who the people are an old group of people who, if we start their history on a plantation, then we don't have any idea who we're talking about. We would be talking about not who they are, but who they were made into. It's a very different thing to talk about who somebody is than to talk about who they were made into. So I always like to begin at the beginning. Africans uh, were the first to uh, develop the concept of family life. The concept of family life started in Africa. And when I look at this picture, you know, I've been, I've traveled to Africa several times and I've seen this uh, uh, displayed in Africa before, the young people sitting in a circle after being out in the hot sun all day. And I think that it's interesting for us to pay attention to what are the things that are really meaningful to African people. And in my readings and study and travel, family is first. That's the first concept among African people. And that would have been uh, initiated by this woman, who they call Lucy, who is also called Mama Dinkanesh. So we're talking millions of years of history. The concept of family started in Africa. Musical instruments were first 
created in Africa. This is a picture of a drum. This is a picture of my favorite instrument, the first of, uh, of many, the finger piano, they call this, and then the stringed instruments. So millions of years ago, not, this isn't recent, these aren't recent. And in fact, what many ar archeologists talk about is that there weren't even other people in existence on the planet during this time. If you wanna read more about uh, music, you can read a book by Francis Baby. Uh, it's called African Music, A People's Art. African Music, A People's Art. To read more about uh, Africans and the creation of the concept of family, you can read a book by Dr. Ben Yakanen, J-O-C-H-A-N-N-A-N, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanen. His book is called The Black Man of the Nile and His Family. Africans were the first to uh, come up with surgery, surgical instruments and to do surgery. And that's an interesting thing to me because I would have gone through all of my schooling. I went through all of my schooling from kindergarten through a PhD without knowing that. This document is called the Edwin Smith Papyrus. You should look that up for yourself. Uh, and and there's, a, a, there's a really interesting piece online about the Edwin Smith Papyrus written by Asa G. Hilliard. And Asa Hilliard talks about the fact that these weren't just documents. These, these were things that they actually did. They were doing surgery. I'm not sure if when you all were in school, if you saw any of that, but to understand who people are becomes really, really critical. Because when I learned about this, when I first learned about this, I compared that to what I had been taught when I was a student in school about Africans. And what I was taught about Africans is that they were poor. And back then that was pretty much it. Now, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but still very little information is there about the actual accomplishments of African people, putting into context why someone would want to celebrate Juneteenth, which we'll get to. The very first king known to man and woman was Narmer. No kings on record before Narmer, and they call the period of time when Narmer would have existed, Dynasty Zero. Anthony Browder does a really good job of talking about this in his book. If you'd like to read what Anthony Browder has to say about uh, Narmer, you can pick up his book called Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. He did, Narmer is known for uniting the land of the uh, upper and lower Egypt. He's one of the premier figures in ancient African history. The man on the right on your screen, his name is Imhotep. Imhotep is known as the world's first multi-genius. I think we're gonna have a party about Juneteenth. We need to understand whose birthday it is and not come to the party with a lack of knowledge, but go to the party informed. Imhotep is world's first multi-genius. They say that he created the study of mathematics and the study of science. On the left is the step pyramid. That's the oldest pyramid known to man and woman. And if you take a look at that, that the architect of that pyramid is the man on the right. It's Imhotep. So one of the reasons why people point out pyramids and why anyone cares about pyramids is because they were created with a mathematical genius that's second to none. They still stand to this day. That's, that one stands, I've been there, as well as the Great Pyramid that we're all familiar with. And they were designed with such precision that there's no cement and things of that nature. They stand, uh, just based on the precision and the laying of bricks. There have been people throughout history to try to take credit away from Africans because of this, but those are, uh, those are more recent notions that, well, they couldn't have done that because the way that we, all, we, we often are taught to think about African people. 
but uh, back then there was no there was no idea of that. For example, Aristotle even said in some of his writings uh, that the Egyptians were black and that they had come up with such interesting uh, uh, such interesting ideas and notions about the world and philosophy that they, they we should take note of it. And and in fact, uh, Plato went to school in Africa at the University of Epetisu, which we'll talk about later. And I think that's an interesting thing because uh, it's not talked about. Uh, and in fact, in today's time, that would be seen as a controversial thing to even talk about. When at the time, there was no, no such idea that there's something wrong with Black people. No such idea in, in the past. This is the University of Ipetisu, the world's first university, which stood for many, many years. The world's first university was on the African continent. And I'd like us to take note of the fact that throughout most of the history, and I'm understand that what I'm talking about is really just not even an inkling. I'm not even talking about an inkling of African history. I'm talking about just enough so that I can make my point when we get to the point where we're talking about Juneteenth. Um, most of this history occurs with small battles between people, but very little war, okay? Very little instances of war. Small battles between people, but very little war. However, there were incursions that were, were we from, from uh, people like Alexander the Great, who uh, begins to lead us on the current path of derailing African history. And I, I call him Alexander of Macedonia instead of the Great. And you can ask yourself, well, from whose lens would he be considered great? Because in African history, the African people wouldn't have considered him great considering what he did, which was to conquer uh, Africa, uh, the, uh, the northeast corner of Africa, uh, which used to be called Kemet. So that's an, a, an interesting thing to think about. If we're going to celebrate Juneteenth or any celebration that has to do with people of African descent, one of the things we might want to do is to start thinking about perspective and lens. For, for example, Alexander was not a great figure in African history, but he is called the great. So that's an example of why we have to think about the language we're using in order for us to build a better and more cohesive society. But that wasn't the end of the African story. In West Africa, we also had one of the great universities to ever uh, be built. The University of San Correa at Timbuktu was in some ways people might say the Harvard University or the Oxford University of its day. Now, I've talked about the University of San Correa at Timbuktu as well as uh, Ipeti Su to young black children and shown the pictures, I won't do that for adults, but shown pictures of the founder of uh, San Correa Timbuktu, Mansa Musa. Um, and black children are in awe that black people owned, if, they, if you will, universities. And that's exciting as well as sad that, uh, that our children go through so much schooling, not understanding and knowing uh, that people of African descent have done such marvelous things. Uh, and again, it is really critical for us to not start our conversation about anything that relates to people of African descent at slavery. That's probably the worst thing you could ever do because it takes the history away from the people. And so knowing about places like the University of San Correa Timbuktu becomes really important homework uh, for us to do. If you want to read more about that, there is a book by Joshua Hammer called The Badass Libraries of Timbuktu. Really good book that goes into some of the uh, specifics of what was taught at Timbuktu as a science, of sort of a science and technology, uh, a, a great institution of its time. I also want to point out the Dogon people. 
Before there was any such thing as a modern telescope, the Dogon people of a country in Africa called Mali, always careful to refer to Africa as a, uh, as a continent and, the, and the, the different countries as countries. But sometimes people think, call Africa a country. But the Dogon people of Mali were the first to explore space. Some say the second, they say that actually the Kemetic people who were renamed um, Egyptos and then renamed Egypt. If you don't know that history, um, you could read a, a book by uh, Chancellor Williams called The Destruction of Black Civilization, where he touches on the different names that have been given to the different places. For example, Native, the Native Americans wouldn't have called the United States America. They would have had a different name for it. And there's all kinds of pieces written on what they called it. In that same sense, the Africans didn't call the northeast corner of Africa Egypt. They called it Kemet. They called it Ta Mary. It is now called Egypt, and they no longer have power there. But um, read on the Dogon people. There's also a guy that you can read on the Dogon people in a serious, uh, they call it the serious myth. Uh, and his name is um, uh, Charles Finch. Charles Finch does a really good job of explaining the accomplishments of the Dogon people, their space accomplishments, and again, the first people to explore, uh, explore space. The Do Dogon is a, an uh, African cultural group, or some people call it tribe. In pre-colonial times, Africans were skilled at mining, teaching their young, and raising successful families. There's a, a fantastic book that I have my students read at Howard called Kendezi, the book on your right, The Congo Art of Babysitting. This talks about how the Africans systematized raising children. They didn't leave it to chance. Uh, they didn't just count on their parents or family members to teach them how. They actually relied on the, their, the ancient ancestors and the people who had come before who actually created systems, what songs do you sing? Uh, when do you teach a child how to cook? What are some of the things that we want them to do, the young people to do in helping to raise the people who were even younger than them? Uh, how do we treat elders? Uh, in what ways do we care uh, for one another? Uh, so it says the Congo art of babysitting, but it's actually much, much deeper. I, I think that Fukiao should have named his book something uh, bigger. Uh, maybe the Congo art of, uh, of, of, of raising children, because it goes into much more than just babysitting. So the Africans were built on this concept of a family that I talked about at the very beginning. It's so important that they didn't leave to chance uh, raising children. Uh, so I think that's really, really important. Now, I think it's important to understand that there was more derailment. So we had this piece. This is, as you see on the left, that's an image that many of us would be sort of familiar with. Um, if you look at the picture on the left, you see that's a picture of derailment. You got to kind of understand it's not slavery, OK? I, I, I would think of this as being on a track and then being knocked off of a track. The reason that's so important is because it teaches us that the Africans had a, they had an agenda. They had, they were living lives that meant something. And they had specific things they were trying to accomplish that got derailed, as you can see with the picture on the left. What the picture on the right shows is that the continent was also derailed by being colonized. This being, and you see pictures of the different European countries that colonized virtually every part of the African continent. Um, and that picture demonstrates a derailing of the people who were in Africa. And the left, one on the left depicts a picture of the derailing of the people who were taken away from Africa, okay? That, I think, is a very important thing for us to understand. We're not just talking about um, 
slavery as if it's sort of like something that, you know, you should get over. We're talking about the derailment of the track that your people were actually on. Critical thing for us to think about before we start talking about um, uh, Juneteenth. So these are the people, and I thought this was an important picture because what it shows is that the people were getting off of boats coming from their homes. They were coming from their homes, coming from a place that was familiar to them, getting off the ships and going to the United States, Jamaica, Colombia, Brazil, the West Indies, as we see on the left, just all these different places throughout the Caribbean where they were enslaved, not just in the United States. So this represents a transition and it represents uh, the, a new order for the Africans that they would have to figure out what is the order of the white people who have kidnapped us and taken us to these different places, okay? We have to acknowledge their humanity by realizing that. But let me just review. We started off by talking about the world's oldest people who came from this Tanzanian region in the Olduvai Gorge region. We moved to talking about Mama Dinkanesh. We talked about the world's oldest musical instruments. We talked about the Edwin Smith papyrus, the oldest medical documents known to, known to man. You can Google most of this. We talked about Narmer, the world's oldest king and his ability to unite the lands. We talked about the Step Pyramid. Incidentally, I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, in these pyram this pyramid, as well as the Great Pyramid that you might be more familiar with, were built 2,500 years before Pythagoras was born. We talked about the person who engineered the Step Pyramid, that's Imhotep. We talked about the University of Ipetisu, the world's oldest university. We talked about uh, the University of uh, San Jose at Timbuktu, in, in, uh, in, Tim in Timbuktu. And as a science capital, I called it the Harvard of its day. Many people refer, refer to it as that. People came from all around the world to go to the University of Santa Maria Timbuktu. We talked about the Dogon people and, and their work with space. We talked about African mining, which happened way before there was ever colonialism. We talked about the ways that African people raised their children and they systematized raising their children. Now that we've talked about all that, let us look at a more contextualized definition of Juneteenth that comes from the experience of the actual people. Now, I want you to listen to this and think about this definition compared to the first one that I gave, which I will also show again after this. I'm gonna read again. After establishing the world's first civilizations, advancing humanity through the establishment of the academic disciplines, Imhotep, providing culture for humanity through the establishment of music and art in pre-dynastic times, establishing the world's first major universities, Ipeti Suit and San Pere, and other contributions that established humanity. Africans were derailed through a project, to, through a European project that enslaved Africans in the diaspora and colonized the entire African continent. Some of the Africans were bought to the United States. Those particular Africans worked for free on plantations in the United States for nearly 300 years. In 1863, a US president, notice I didn't say his name because I'm centering on the experience of the people. A US president signed a proclamation to end enslavement. However, since it was outlawed for Africans to read and think critically, they did not know about emancipation, so they worked for free for two and a half additional years until June 19, 1865, which is the date when they were informed about emancipation. Now, did you notice I didn't name the person who they say came to Texas to inform the people that, they, that there was an emancipation proclamation? 
There's a reason I didn't name that person. One is because I'm centering the people. Two is because what many people don't know is that before that person uh, went into Texas to inform, there were a number of black um, soldiers, et cetera, who had gone down into uh, Texas to tell, the, to tell all, people all over Texas that this had happened, that there was an Emancipation Proclamation. But those people's names are not known in history. In modern times, some African descendants celebrate June 19th, while other African descendants do not celebrate it because they do not feel as though Black people are free psychologically. Those descendants often refer to emancipation as an illusion. So it becomes important for us to understand Black perspectives on Juneteenth and how a person could understand if you don't know history, if you believe your history started in, sla in enslavement, then you would think of Juneteenth only as a great celebration. But if you know the history that we just went through, 6,000 years of history, if you know that history, then you would be able to contextualize Juneteenth. Now let's look back again at the old definition of Juneteenth. Having had all that, this is what many people today believe is happening. An unofficial American holiday also called Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Cell Liberation. Think, think about what we know. Celebrated annually on June 19th in the United States to commemorate, now watch how we center, Union Army Gordon Granger, reading of federal orders in the city of Galveston, Texas, uh, in 1865, proclaiming that all enslaved persons in the U.S. state of Texas were now free. Now we're going to take a look at some stereotypical stuff. Watermelon and red soda are the oldest traditional foods on Juneteenth. First of all, that's not really true. Commemorating the blood that Black people spilled during enslavement. There were traditional foods, watermelon and red soda were not those foods. Some authors note that there has always been soul food served. Soul food had not been, um, quote, discovered by this time. Soul food came much later than 1865. Fried chicken, barbecue, greens, and black eyed peas. I don't know where the internet got this from, but that's not actually accurate. And, but this is what people think it is. So if you've got people, the last part is true about reading the Emancipation Proclamation. If you've got people who don't know the history, but want to come to the party, then what you have is a royal mess. And what we need to do is to begin to use the information to inform people. The most important aspect of Juneteenth isn't food and celebration, it is the fact that the, that people of African descent use their knowledge and use their fight uh, to get themselves physically free from enslavement. But what, what we really should use this for is as a reason to go back and study African history. So first consider, this is my argument uh, related to the illusion. Juneteenth is an unofficial, this is a, a lens, this is a mainstream lens. Juneteenth is an unofficial holiday commemorating the day when African descendants in the U.S. learned of the Emancipation Proclamation, okay? Consider the lens on this one. When the context of history and legacy of African people, within the context of the history and legacy of African people, Juneteenth is a moment that occurred during the Ma'afa. Ma'afa is a Swahili word that means period of black destruction which marked a time when people of African descent in the United States were emancipated from physical bondage. So the reason why this interpretation is important is because it centers and connects the black, the total black experience connecting Africans to their long legacy. It recognizes that more work must be done in order for the Ma'afa to end. It distinguishes physical bondage from psychological and other bondage. And it respects the fact that Africans in the United States are one group of Africans who were enslaved in the Americas, but there are other groups of Africans who were enslaved as well, such as in Brazil, Jamaica, uh, you, the West, you just, you name it, all throughout the Americas. So I think that 
the Juneteenth celebration should not be for us about just the day, June 19th, and having a good time in celebration of Emancipation Proclamation, but it should be an opportunity for us to correct the historical record and also to inform ourselves deeply so that we can participate in things in an informed way. And I wanna just kind of, I'm coming to my close, ask you, what did you notice about the difference between the two definitions? Which definition resonates with you? And it should say, and why? The contextualized definition or the popular definition? I think these are the kinds of questions we want to ask as we celebrate Juneteenth and also begin to pay what it looks like is gonna be a little bit more attention to uh, issues related to black history and culture. We want you to help support our effort to contextualize Black History Juneteenth and promote equity. If you look at the, I'm going to put that link up that is where we're contextualizing maroonage. Maroonage is a, is a, are, the maroons, and we talked about that in my introduction, the maroons are groups of African people who were able to escape slavery in the United States and other places by beating the enslaver and then establishing villages uh, that were hidden away. My business partner and I created a YouTube video. Uh, I'm sorry, not a YouTube video, a documentary that's, that you can watch on YouTube that contextualizes the Pelanqueros of Colombia. That's a group of Maroons. We want to raise funds, about 300,000, to create films that contextualize Black history. And the reason why this is important is for the same reason why we need to contextualize Juneteenth. We need to contextualize all of the things that you're gonna start hearing about if this latest uh, wave of learning about black people, black history, black celebrations continues. The thing to keep in mind is that many people are doing stuff, but they don't have the knowledge to sort of buoy what it is that, that they're saying. You have to have the knowledge so that we can move, actually move things forward and not move forward in ignorance. So if you know people or if you would like to help us raise these funds so that we can do this, again, I'm gonna give you this YouTube link so you can watch the film. You can also donate and support to us. I'm sorry, donate to us and support us. If you would like to contribute to that, uh, here's our PayPal and our GoFundMe. Uh, we are actively, going to do this. We, we just want to see if you want to support us. And here's how you can reach the Chi Institute. Uh, I've given you my email address. That's the Chi Institute email address. This is our Facebook. And again, if on YouTube, you can search for the title For Humanity, Culture, Community, and Maroonage. I'm Kim Chak, and I'd like to thank you for your time with me today. And I, I'm not sure if there are questions, but there are, uh, there are, there are questions. All right. okay, so, so here's what I want y'all to understand, uh, GA family. I asked Dr. Shockley to, uh, to, to, to give me about 60 to 75 percent of, uh, of who I know who he really is. Um, and so y'all getting 60 to 75 percent. Maybe one time we'll get to the point where I can have him come back and give us a full 100 percent. I, 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 I toned it way down. <laughs> I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> Um, and, and for the GA family, I want to uh, remind you all that next Wednesday, uh, Dr. Shockley and I are going to um, be together at our home where we grew up in Indianapolis for a face-to-face uh, -face fireside chat with the GA family. So we hope you'll also join us for that. So let me start off, Dr. Shockley, by saying that um, the, the um, amount of feedback you got in here from people who are saying that this is amazing dropping bombs i mean we've got folks who are saying that they are upset because they went through years of um educations master prepared and never heard of any of this that you were talking about so to that end we've got lots of um questions in here about the books that you uh reference they, they want sure. to reference um so i don't know if we'll be able to get a list together of the various books we can i can send you a list of those books Okay, we'll get that list of books then for y'all who are asking that question, and we will make sure that we email it to the folks who are registered on this list. 
The other question you're getting, Dr. Shockley, is people want these links, especially the links to the videos and things of that nature. Um, I don't know if uh, you can um, exit out. Will we share a list of the books with the recording. Um, we will exit. If you can exit out, copy that and just paste it in the chat. Those They're links looking for the film? Uh, to the film, just all those different links. Just grab all that text and throw it in the chat. Sure. To, it's going to uh, take me a few minutes, but I'll do it now. Mm -hmm. Just email me the link, brother. I'll do it for you if it's going to take you several minutes. to just trying to, to get in here and get it. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so I think those are the uh, the baseline questions other than the, um, this was extraordinary. This has been eye-opening. One of the questions, Dr. Shockley, that someone asked was, was Ethiopia ever colonized? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I haven't studied that closely, but here's what I know. Ethiopia is seen as being the only country on, on the continent of Africa that was not colonized, but there are people who will argue about the fact that Ethiopia was, um, there's an Italian influence in Ethiopia that has come from uh, oppression of the Italian people as they began to interact with mm -hmm. uh, the Ethiopians. Um, so again, I haven't studied that, but I know that, that, that there are people who would like, to, who want to point out that Ethiopia might not have been fully colonized, fully colonized but they do have that Italian influence there that, that has been Thank harmful you. to them. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, one, one, um, one person, I don't know if it's a male or female, they said they called their five-year-old son, uh, their five-year-old, they didn't say son or daughter, and made them sit down and listen to this lecture because it was so powerful. Um, not a question, but um, but a praise. They want to praise um, uh, you for this presentation. As a black person, I thought I was aware of the history that um, that we are not being taught that in school. But this was even more eye-opening. Thank you so much for spreading this knowledge. And there's lots of praises like that. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, support does the black community appreciate from the non-black community during Juneteenth with what is happening today? Okay. Uh, I missed the. I missed that question. Gonna, we're gonna figure out where we're gonna. Um, uh, are, are you gonna uh, raise it up? Or are you gonna uh, talk about war? I didn't hear the question. The question is, what kind of support does the black community appreciate from the non-black community during Juneteenth with what is happening today? Now, now, see, y'all are asking him to um, to talk about war. And, and we're, we're going to raise the limit if we let him fully answer that question. But uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and dive into this a little bit. No, I, I actually, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat it one more time. I, I'm not sure if I understand what I'm being asked. Go ahead one more time. One more time, brother. What kind of um, support does the Black community appreciate from non-Black community during Juneteenth with what is happening today? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the thing that uh, there's so many different ways that a person. Let me, let me throw one more question in there with that, if you don't mind. We're going to combine these. Um, how should the white community recognize uh, Juneteenth? Do we celebrate or do we pause? We're going to put both of those together and let you go. All right. So I think that what groups, all groups can do, and I'll respond to what white, whites can do in a second, but what all groups can do is to encourage black people to be black because unfortunately because of all the things that have happened a lot of black people um, are ashamed to be black and or they go through lots of trouble to try to make themselves less threatening and you see what happens when people feel threatened by black people. We have all the death. But what we do need is we need for people to, to, to encourage black people to be black and to be proud of being black, um, as opposed to wanting to see themselves as being something else. White people can do that as well. But what I think white people can do, to be honest with you, one of the things that white people can do that no one else can do is to support those black people who are actually trying to do good work and not just the black people you're comfortable with. <clears throat> a lot of times what happens with white people because they have the power and the resources, um, certain black people 
the ones who, 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 there are some black people whose whole life goal or whole way of being in life is to make sure that white people are comfortable. And they do that at the expense of educating white people. They say, I want you to be comfortable. So they do things and it's, it can be hard to navigate that type of space. So what white people can do is to say, maybe I should spend some time being uncomfortable so that I can actually learn the things I need to learn. Um, I think those are things that people can do. Okay, okay, I got one for you right here. Sure. Okay, um, April, I'm gonna ask this question. We're gonna see what happens. <clears throat> if Dr. Shockley could tell us something at 100%, what would he tell us? Um, that I can't really answer that question, but I would say that there has been a war waged on Black people. And uh, what we're going to have to do as a Black community is acknowledge that it's not just racism and white supremacy. It's actually a war. And what we're going to have to do is to stop thinking that we can do whatever we want to do and instead do what we need to do uh, so that we can win the war. Now, what we hope is that we have as many people as possible fighting on the side of right. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, again, there's lots of black people who fight against other black people in that war. Hey, thank you for that, brother. Okay, so um, let's see what we have in here. Um, there's a question, um, African-Americans have a loss of culture. How can we raise our black children in a way that honors our uh, ancestry, even though we have no, link, uh, no direct links to it, ties to it? Well, I don't know. I, 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 all of the black people who, who, who are in the diaspora throughout um, the United States and uh, you know, Trinidad and South America and uh, all across the Atlantic all have a connection to Africa. Some argue that all people have a connection to Africa. So the Africans definitely have a connection to Africa. Once you decide that you are going to connect to the African continent as a Black person, you won't have any problems figuring out, learning about, and getting yourself connected to that which is there waiting for you to connect to it. So I had, I had the same question when I was in my early 20s, but by the time I was in my early 30s, I had decided that I wanted to connect. And when I tried to connect, I was dragged right on in and learned a ton of things about who I was, my ancestors, uh, where, where, like all those cultural traditions and things we spoke about today and beyond are things that I learned when I said I wanted to, to get in there. So now I'm of a perspective and understanding that there is absolutely nothing in the way of that connection. There's nothing in the way except for whatever is in you that is making you not do it yet. And as soon as you decide to do it, um, you'll see that uh, it's not a difficult journey to go on. It's one of the more natural things you can do. I put my email address out there. And if people are interested in connecting with some of the things we're doing, the, our organization is the Ka Institute. Um, and I just sent that as well. Uh, this is our email address, the Ka Institute at gmail.com. We have a number of things. For example, we travel, we go across the world. We had, we, we had a trip planned to go do a Black History tour in Colombia this year, but because of COVID, we couldn't do it. We also had a trip to Africa planned that, that got postponed. So we do all kinds of things. Uh, and, and so what you have to do is connect with people who are doing things that are gonna help create that connection back to uh, the continent of Africa, where the culture and history does still live. but is under attack as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Shockley, I've got several people in here that are asking how they can take a course with you um, in your classes. Now, people need to be careful what they ask for because he's, yeah, he's, he's a, 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 
an amazing teacher, but he has high standards. Uh, you want to answer that question for him, brother? Taking a class from me would require that you... Um... And they want to see if they can do it online. If they can take an online... It was uh, the person's in New Jersey, and they want to know if there's an opportunity to take classes with you um, online uh, of any, mm -hmm. any way. Well, I mean, I guess what you'd have to do is enroll... Any class that's offered right now is online at Howard University. Um, if, you know, you'd have to just register for one of the classes that I teach at the university. Uh, the class that I teach that's closest to what we talked about today, I'm going to type that into the, into the uh, com conversation. It's called, it's, called the hist it's called the History of Black Education. And I go into the, all this stuff in greater detail. Um, and I, we don't, Howard, we don't have an online program necessarily. Uh, but our classes are currently online, but it's called the History of Black Education. The department that I'm in, I'm typing that to, in there too. It's called Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. I spelled leadership wrong. So I'll, I'll send that out and I can take the next question. There are questions about, uh, about resources. I'm trying to get to that question. Someone asked a question about um, other reliable resources. Um, let's see if I can find it. Here's a, here's a question while I'm looking for that one. Um, as a white woman, what is the best way for me to commemorate Juneteenth um, in addition to attending the webinar? I think you kind of answered that, would you say? Um, I think that we need to encourage black people to be black, not just listen to the black people that make us feel good and support black people who are doing things that are trying to cause, bring the healing to the situation that Black people find themselves in today. Jimmy, are you muted? Yeah, here's a question for you. What's your uh, thoughts on Anthony um, Browder's um, Nile, um, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization book? Is it a book you approve of and is it reliable? I think that it's a reliable book. I think just like most books, that it's not a perfect book, but it's a great book and I use it in my classes. So yeah, I do, I do like Nile Valley Contributions because of the truth that's in it. I'm gonna put a couple names of two different books that, are, that I have done recently. One is um, that you can take a look at and it kind of goes into some of the things that you see happening today. It's called Campus Uprisings, and it's published by Teachers College Press at Columbia University. And, and, and then there's a book that I think will help us figure out some of these things. It's a brand new book. In fact, you can pre-order it. It's called African-Centered Education, uh, and it's published by Myers Press. And you can find both of these, these books on Amazon. Uh, you can order teach, uh, Campus Uprisings on Amazon. If you want to know more about what's happening right now in terms of all the uprising, and particularly the uprisings that are on college campuses that are going to start happening. And you can, you can the book that uh, I just finished it is African Centered Education, Myers Education Press, and it'll be available. You can pre-order it now, actually, and so you can get it as soon as the, it, it, it's hot, hot off the press. I think that um, what I've done in my books is try to be reminiscent of a lot of the things that we've talked about today. Jimmy, you're muted again. We're going to start to, uh, to, um, to wrap up, but the question that a lot of folks are asking, uh, Dr. Shockley, is um, that they, there's uh, people, a lot of folks are saying they brought their kids in to listen to you. A lot of them, 12-year-old, 5-year-old kids, they're bringing all their kids in to listen to you because you're, you're, you're giving them knowledge that not only do their parents not know, but they want their children to know this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also there are several questions in here around how do we get this level of knowledge into the school system? Um, and I know this is one of your areas of, um, you've written books on um, the miseducation, especially of black boys and things of that nature. So can you talk a little bit about how do we help the uh, school systems uh, um, uh, bring this level of knowledge? I just typed the name of that book into the, um, into the chat. 
But let me also, the, my first book, The Miseducation of Black Children. One of the things that you have to understand is that the school system is just like the society. In order to get anything to happen, you have to work on it for decades. Um, there have been lots of us working on the school system, trying to get the school system to be more inclusive of a different perspective for my entire career. Um, and then there are people who, who, who died old people, unable to get the school system to do anything. Um, if there is a movement, then the school system will change. It will not change without a movement though. The school system is, is, is like a, I say in one of my articles that I've written, a mighty oak tree standing tall and proud and unmoving. That's a, a, a because it does, it just, they, what they do is they rearrange things, but the education system that exists today in schools is very similar to the one that existed when I was a, a student in schools in the 1980s. Um, so you, you a few different books, but sometimes the same old books. The school system is, is rough. Let me ask I mean, you this. There's yeah. a question that just came in where someone said, what are the resources available for children? Since we can't move the school system, what are some resources for children to help get them to where they need to be? Let me, get, I'm going to type into the chat. Uh, a name of a book that I wrote with Kofi Lenin. And it talks about, and it's a book that you can also order on Amazon. It talks about um, some of the things we discussed today, particularly maroonage. Um, there are so many resources. At the Kai Institute, uh, Kofi l does a, um, a broadcast where he reads to children black books. And so if you go to our YouTube page, which again is under the Kai Institute, um, and I just type that into the chat again. You can you that's a resource for children. The book that I just named is resource for children. And then what you can do is go to our Facebook page, get on our Facebook, and we put out resources all the time uh, related to to resources that we can use for our children. One of the most important things for parents to do though is to educate themselves. And those other books that I named and uh, getting in touch, watching our film, those things set a person on a path to self-education and re-education, then, so we do have support, we have resources at the Kai Institute, but you just have to connect with us. And when you connect with us, we'll have, we have, we have the stuff that you need. So, so um, brother, you have over 200 questions left in here. So um, here's- I think I can handle it. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and, uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this. Um, but I wanna say to the thousand plus people that are still on the line, even though we're over, and the over 1,700 people that stayed for the entire presentation you gave, I wanna say thank you all for, for doing this. And I also wanna, I'm gonna put something out there, brother. We received a lot of um, pushback from folks about the initial title of your presentation, The Illusion of Juneteenth. I heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you know, you know. Um, so what, someone asked, so what do you think of the illusion and how do you feel? Does that, does that, does that capture the challenge that we're in right now that even the title saying the illusion of Juneteenth presents a problem? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we're going to close out on this one, but I want to go ahead and let you uh, turn it up for him. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, this is the old saying that if you start Black people's history at slavery, everything looks like progress. Mm. Um, so what we have to do is to understand that our history doesn't start there. It starts in the Old Divide Gorge. So if we get the information, the knowledge that we need, and we start to actually study and do the homework that we're supposed to do. We've offered that you connect with the Kai Institute. Uh, we're one of the think tanks that's out there that you can connect with where you can get information and knowledge. But our idea really is to just do your work, do your work. And I think it's Ian Levanzant who says that now I understand. You have to do your work, nothing happens if you don't do your work. And it's not good enough to just march. I'm not, I'm not upset at marchers. I think marchers did a great job. I'm not upset at uh, people who wanna celebrate Juneteenth, not at all. But what we have to do is do our work. 
and we can help you um, in the process of doing your work. We do things, we, we are so active uh, in things that the Kai Institute does, but also in the work that I do at Howard University. We're, we don't sit around, we do work. So connect with us and don't be shy about sending emails, don't be shy about uh, asking us for resources. Um, just let us know what you need and we're on top of it. We're waiting for you, so yeah. So I want to thank you. Um, th like I said, this brother and I um, go back to uh, to elementary school together, um, and um, uh, he's he's one of my closest uh, brothers, friends. Uh, we uh, we we share uh, families, uh, we share grief, and we share joy. And and I've never shared him with a personal, a professional network that I've been a part of because um, I think this is a, a part of who I am and how I've become the man I am. So I. Um, I want to thank you all for um, being a part of this. I want to thank General Assembly for leaning into what could have been a very um, uh, uncomfortable conversation for some organizations. And I want to thank you all, the, uh, the learners and audience, for taking time on Juneteenth to learn about something other than maybe what you necessarily, what's in your field. So no, this is not a, a technical um, conversation, but we Black folks helped um, uh, build technology, as he was talking about when he talked about the pyramids. So we want to make sure that um, that we, from a GA perspective, we thank you all. What we do at GA is we drop knowledge. Sometimes it's technical and sometimes it's uh, life changing. And we hope you've received a life changing moment for us. For those of you that are internal GA folks, we, uh, we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday where uh, Dr. Shockley and I are going to sit down and uh, share a beverage and, um, and talk like two brothers that have um, known each other for most of our lives. With that, we want to thank you all so much. Peace and y'all be safe. Thank you.